Uh, everybody will remain on mute until that point. Uh, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to the person who will be introducing Irma, namely Armando Ibarra, who is a professor in the UW School for Workers and director of the Chicano Chicana Latino Latina Studies Program here at UW. Armando, please take over. Muchísimas gracias, Patrick, y bienvenidos a todos. Um, it is my absolute honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Irma Alicia Velasquez Vita Yu. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure on so many levels for me to be able to have this conversation. Normally, it would, it would be an opportunity for us to learn from, from Irma here at Madison and build community face to face. But unfortunately, um, given our current pandemic and the current times, we cannot, um, we cannot host you here in Madison. But here we are. And I am, you know, I am very uh, excited to learn fr from you, doctor, and I will go on with my introduction. Um, she is a Maya Kiche, social anthropologist and journalist. She has been at the forefront of struggles for respect for indigenous cultures. She was executive director of the Mecanismo de Apoyo a Pueblos Indígenas, Oxlahuj Tixlin. Um, support mechanism for indigenous people from 2005 to 2013. In 2002, she played a key role in the historical process of setting legal precedents through a court case that made racial discrimination illegal in Guatemala. She is the author of La Justicia Nunca Estuvo de Nuestro Lado, Justice Was Never on Our Side, uh, published in 2019. Uh, she published Lunas y Calendarios, Poesía Guatemalteca in 2018, Pueblos Indígenas, Estado y Lucha por Tierra in Guatemala, Indigenous Nations, um, State and Struggle for Land in Guatemala in 2008, and La Pequeña Burguesía Indígena Comercial de Guatemala, Desigualdades de Clase, Raza y Género, 2003. She's a regular contributor to ContraPunch, um, one of my news sources that I like to go to regularly. And this is an online news source. Most recently, um, she published the following editorials with these titles, The Power of the White Man and His Symbol is Being Demystified, Organized Indigenous Communities and Indigenous Knowledge Can Prevent the Spread of COVID-19, and What the Impunity Commission Taught Guatemala. She has held several academic appointments in, in the last several years. Currently, she's an Edward LaRoque Tinker Visiting Professor at the Center for Latin American Studies at Stanford University. She was also the Craig M. Kogut Visiting Professor of Latin American Studies at Watson Institute um, at Brown University. She was a Mellon Visiting Professor in the in Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at Duke University. Um, you know, some words that describe Dr. Velasquez Nimatu is she's an activist and a scholar, a very accomplished academic. She's a human rights advocate, and she's an international social movement leader who centers the indigenous struggle in resistance to empire and capitalism. Um, in culture, she studies culture, political economy, Mayan and human rights. And I really look forward to this presentation and to engage with this audience with you, Dr. Bienvenida. Thank you so much, Armando, for your words. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. I want to talk the Havens Writing Writer uh, Center for Social Justice. Centro Hispano and Caribbean and Iberian Studies Program and the Chicano and Latina Studies Program for the opportunity it gives me to be able to make this presentation. I want to share my screen with everybody. Okay. And I want to start my presentation. This presentation focuses on the problematic nature of court orders, reparation, and the struggle for human rights for indigenous people, specifically women in Guatemala. By discussing the Sepur Sarko case, named after 
an almost unknown Quechi community in El Estor Izabal, Department of Northeast Guatemala, I would like to show how racist, sexual violence, and poverty collage during the Guatemala genocide period from 1975 to 1988. This fusion in turn not only increased the violent nature of state sponsored human rights abuses, but also illustrate how those oppressions continue to affect indigenous war survivors today. Survivor testimonies and military official statement show that the state through its army and paramilitary group systematically deployed sexual violence against indigenous women as a mechanism of torture, control, and annihilation during the internal art conflict that official, officially lasted from 19, 1960 to 1996. Given that most of these crimes remain in impunity, I ask what are the limitations of court order? Reparation to address the root causes of these violations. Beyond obligating the state to perform its most elemental, elemental, elemental duties, how might, how might the outcomes of transitional justice cases like Sepur Sarko contribute to structural changes in the Guatemalan state and society in the struggle for human rights for indigenous people and war survivors. If this presentation is divided in five parts. In the first, I will present how racism and violence against indigenous women in Guatemala has a strong tie with land history of this position. In the second part, I will focus on the time of the genocide, the most deadly stage of a 36 year war that my country faced. In the third part, I will refer to the struggle for justice of the women of the Pursarco after the army killed the men in the community and turned them into sexual slaves. In the fourth part, I will refer to measures of reparation that the court issued after the trial. And finally, I will conclude with the lessons of the struggle for transitional justice in a country like Guatemala so allow, allow me tend to start with the first part. Racism and violence against indigenous women in Guatemala. An analysis of the Sepur Sarko case must begin with a reflection on the historical racism and violence against indigenous women in Guatemala to understand the facts of the case and its overall significance. It is so because the crimes that the women of the Sepur Sarko denounced in the quest for justice reflect the wider confluence of racism, sexual violence, and economic exploitation of indigenous people in Guatemala during the internal conflict. Indeed, racism and violence against indigenous women often expressed through sexual violence were part of the state's ideological terror that played a key role in the planning and execution of disappearances, massacres, and rapes during this time. In a larger sense, however, the sexual violence and slave labor that the state perpetrated in Sepur Sarko form a, continu a, con a continuation of illegal centuries old practices of denigrating indigenous women inherent 
dignity that have never been judged in Guatemala. As a system of oppression, racism is one of the pillars that structure the socioeconomic and political relation in the country. And it has played a fundamental role in the formation of the Guatemala nation state. Servitude, racial discrimination, and violence against indigenous women have been a constant in Guatemala's history since Spanish colonization in the 16th century. With the imposition of the colonial regime, early example of racism emerged in the form of geographic segregation and, subordin and subordination of indigenous people under the case system, the Leyes Nuevas of 1542 that declared that indigenous people free subjects of the Spanish king if they agree to live concentrated in Pueblos de Indios. According to Curuchich Gomez, during the implantation of the colonial system in Guatemala, this racist ideology facilitated the physical action of stripping away lands from indigenous people in different stages and with diverse justification, among which the encomienda stand out for its cruelty in humanity. The encomienda labor system lies the foundation of land tenure in Guatemala and one of, of its elemental characteristic was the monopoly of the Spanish over the productive and extensive lands, latifundios, whose products will be commercialized to satisfy external needs and a minimum amount of land necessary for the survival of the indigenous labor force, minifundio. With the destruction of the social nucleus, indigenous women face in the beginning systematic rapes and the separation of their families. Independence from Spain in 1821 did little to alter the relative position of indigenous people. Criollo and Ladino elites replaced Europeans at the top of the social hierarchy, but they solidified the power through the continuing operation of indigenous in the new republic. Independence marked the beginning of the liberal period of the 19th century, during which time state races strained through the creation of a legal framework that imposed for labor regimes on indigenous people. To advance the, the, uh, their a hegemonic project, the liberals promoted an economic and political agenda that included expropriating the Catholic Church latifundios, sell, selling state lands after declaring them vacant, and dispossessing indigenous communities of the communal lands they still possess. In addition, Guatemala elites during the liberal period created legal instrument within the state that served the interest of elites who needed land to cultivate coffee. Such was the case of the Decreto 103 of 1873 that considered communal lands property in dead hands of Decreto 112 of 18. 74 under which communal lands fell into debt. They labor regulation known as a Reglamento de Jornaleros of 1877 also provided massive and forced indigenous labor for free by obligating indigenous men from communities to work on plantation in condition of slavery. During this period in Guatemala, an oppressive protectionist serving an oligarchy structure 
provide that enforce severe levels of exclusion. Along with the long dictatorship of Rafael Carrera y Turcios, from 1851 to 1865, Justo Rufino Barrios, from 1873 to 1885, Manuel Estrada Cabrera, from 1898 to 1920, and Jorge Ubico, from 1931 to 1944. Finally, after process of consciousness, racing and political action, this condition gave way to a revolution on October 20th in 1944. The new political regime created among others delayed the titulación supletoria, which protected the property rights for those who worked a piece of land for 10 years without a title. It is also implemented the Código de Trabajo that established free contracting of labor relations, minimum wage, and the right to unionize in the countryside and the city. The revolution of 1944 concludes with the Contra Revolution that began in 1954 and would become a, a decisive event in Guatemala history due to the long term consequences that it set in motion in the social structures, political goals, and everyday lives of Guatemala citizens. Principal actors behind the Contra Revolution were the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States, the Guatemala oligarchy, and the upper hierarchy of the Catholic Church. These three marked the emergence of a profoundly repressive and racist state apparatus that nevertheless incorporated elements of the discrimina discriminatory and coercive pol political culture of the past. So, fomenting a, confrontation, a confrontational situation in the country and the closing of democratic channels that started a 36 year long conflict that ended with the signing of the peace accord in 1996. So since the arrival of the Spanish in the 16th century, sexual violence has been used in parallel to racial discrimination. And both have been used to achieve more effective control over the bodies, minds, and individual and collective lives of indigenous women. Given this history, how did racism and sexual violence come together during the genocide the the genocide period of the armed conflict in Guatemala to increase the violent nature of the state against indigenous women like the Maya Quechi of the Sepur Sarco. I went now to the genocide, genocide period from 1965 to 1988. After 1954, a series of military governments assumed power in Guatemala by fraudulent elections. In the process, everyday life in the country became militarized at all levels and in all, and in all spaces. Room for debate or dissident clause as those in power so to eliminate any opposition. Guatemala society became so polarized that popular movements made up of unions members, students, professionals, workers, teachers, or peasants that demanded social change were brutally repressed. As a result, armed guerrilla organizations are army focused mainly in the rural zones of the north and west of the country emerged. Those groups committed 
themselves to arm a struggle to end the injustice and socioeconomic inequalities. The Guatemala state through the army and its paramilitary forces dedicated itself to destroy all social movements. It viewed as a threat in the name of anti-communist, putting into practice the concept of Mao Zedong inspired by removing the water from the fish, quitarle el agua al pez, or separating the guerrillas from, this, from their support base among the civilian population. On the ground, these policies led the state through the institution of the army to carry out crimes against humanity to carry out crimes against humanity, including massive and systematic rape and labor exploitation of indigenous women all over the country. During the time as president, first General Fernando Romeo Lucas Garcia, and then the General Jose Efraín Rios Mont, set out create a new counterinsurgent state that in practice would defend the traditional privileges of the oligarchy and protect the economic interests of large landowners. Furthermore, Rios Mont employed evangelical fervor and discourse regarding the need to save Guatemala from he described as a the diabolic position of the communist insurrection. So historical disdain for indigenous people joined with the state anti-communist fight and current of evangelical religious ideologies to facilitate the extermination of indigenous communities. With the objective to destroy any attempt to, to dismantle the structure of, econom of economic exploitation, racial discrimination, and social and political marginalization in Guatemala that the, ex that the, that the state executed repressed acts through the army's plans, Victoria 83, Firmeza 83, and Reencuentro Institucional 84, along with, oper with Operation Plan Sofia. Under the cover of an anti-communist tactic, Within the general context of the Cold War and the United States support, the state therefore implemented a campaign, a campaign of terror, which included the physical extermination of any person or community it believed to be communist. A state terrorist combined with the historical fear and hatred of indigenous rebellion which led to entire regions being milita militarized and outposts like those in Sepur Sarko, leading to indiscrimin indiscriminate violence against the indigenous Maya population in the form of torture, collective murder, and rape. In the 19 1999, the Commission for Historical Clarification published the result of a broad study about the act of violence and crimes committed during the internal conflict in Guatemala. This commission concluded that the Guatemala state was responsible for 93% of all human rights violations and acts of, of violence that it was able to the community. Also, the commission declared that the state forces committed 626 massacres against Maya children, women, some of them were pregnancy, elderly and men in communities across the country. 
it destroyed and burned entire villages with people, homes, and everything a survive uh, and everything that survivors possess. Member of the army raped Maya women and girls, often before murdering them. As part of the genocide to attack not only their bodies, but also their families and communities whom they wished to terrorize, to terrorize and control. Entire villages also had to relocate and live in concentration camps that the state called model villages or development poles. As the state considered the entire Maya population as a potential internal enemy, it attacked all 22 Mayan people in the country, but inflicted severe human rights abuses against the Achi, Kechi, Ishi, Kanjoban, and Kachikel people because of the rebellions, the rebelliousness. These peoples face acts of genocide by the state which in the end took more than 200,000 lives, led to more than a million internally displaced people and refugees, and left more than 50,000 people disappear. The history of the Sepur Sarko community is truly connected to this larger reality. Let me now move on to the third part of this presentation. The Maya Kekchi community of the Sepur Sarpo. This community lies in the Polo Chic Valley in a region of the Eastern Department of Izabal with a long history of land conflict and disposition of indigenous peasants. Many studies describe the concentration of fertile lands in the hands of elite and foreign landowners, military officials, and international corporations like the United Fruit Company, which reproduce a plantation system based on the forced labor of dispossessed Kekchi people. In the interview that I made to the women of the Sepur Sarko, they told me that their parents migrated from San Pedro Cachacoban and Senahu migrating to the area of the Sepur Sarko in the 1950s and the 1960s to escape the extreme exploitation condition they confront as a laborers on coffee plantation. Beginning in the, in the 1978, peasant farmers, farmers uh, in the region from Sepur Sarko organized into communities to seek legal position of the lands they, they occupy by applying for property titles through the National Institute of Agrarian Transformation. Tensions in the area increased as did indigenous people's mob mobilization to secure their land tenure after the Pansos, anti the Pansos massacre on May 1978, in which the army killed 140 Kekchi peasants who had demand respect for the land rights. Simultaneously, a group of local plantation owners began to view indigenous residents with suspicion, and they sought for the Guatemala army to intervene to protect their own property. As a result, the Guatemala army estab established a military outpost in the communities of Sepur Sarco and Las Tinajas in 1982, under the command of, of General Efraín Ríos Montt. The circumstances was more worthy because there was no guerrilla presence in the Sepur Sarco, and hence no reason to justify the presence of the army. The connection between the army's repression and local organizing for land was direct as security forces arrived with, li with lists of community leaders names to capture them. Indeed, the Messiah Yad, one of the survivors, said, what I remember is that when my husband was alive, he would participate in meetings in the community. He did not go outside the Porzarco, but in the community, he would attend meetings. 
when the army grabbed him, they accused him. You are part of the guerrilleros. You are one of the people that come down from the mount. mount. You are a mount people, sos gente del monte. They were accused him of passing food to the guerrillas. The installment of the Guatemala army in 1982 marked the beginning of a series of brutal acts committing against women involving threats, murder, and a systematic rape, as well as sexual and domestic slavery. That year, security forces tortured, disappeared, and murdered most of the men and teenagers of the communities. In the communities, the military outposts, they also systematically raped women and girls of all ages and in different stages of pregnancy. While other women fled to the mounds, the army tents forced the remaining survivors to relocate to the area sur surrounding the military outpost where the widows going every three days to the post to serve the troops. This, this so-called service, including domestic slavery in the form of cleaning, preparing food for an average of 400 soldiers and washing soldier clothes. It is also included sexual slavery as women experience constant and massive rapes by soldiers and officials during in the military outposts. Their homes in front of their small children and the river. This violence occurred over a period of six years. Although the outpost concluded to operate in, 19, in 1988, the suffering, fear, poverty, and stigma surrounding these crimes led survivors to remain silent for years. After the signing of the peace accord in 1996, and with a psychological support, some women began to speak about what they had what they had endured during the armed conflict. It was not until 2011, during the first tribunal of consciousness against sexual violence toward women during the armed conflict in Guatemala, that survivors, women's organization and activists began to build a case against military commanders of the outpost. That year, a group of 15 Kekchi decided to pursue justice in national courts. Although Magdalena Pop, one of the survivors, passed away from cervical cancer while their case, while their case was still advanced in advancing in the legal system, the remaining women carry out their collective struggle to hold accountable some of those responsible for the crimes. When the case finally went to the trial in February 2016, the 14, the 14 surviving Kiche women sat in open court with their faces covered for security reasons. Why, in the previous month, they had submit, submitted the pre trial recorded testimonies as evidence before the court. Some agreed to testify in person again, and with the help of an interpreter, they told the judges and the countries of the crimes they endured. In these testimonies, the women tell the torture that the soldiers subjected their husband before disappearing them. Some recall their time in the mountains, watching their children die for disease, malnutrition, or machete guns that the army and civil patrol inflicted up them as they fled 
they lamented how they could not give their loved one a proper burial in hiding and under constant persecution from the security forces. They told how the military forced, forced them to take contraceptives while performing their service so that they would not become pregnant from rapes. The, 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 the women shared how the army made them buy their own cleaning and cooking supplies. And even after the formal services ended, they still had to deliver tortillas daily, even if this means starvation for their children. The testimonies lasted for hours and hours in which the women talk, talked about the methodological way the army had violent them, destroyed their family structure and altered their overall way of life. Despite the pain with their presence and their voices, these women spoke for the thousands of others who have remained silent or died without obtaining justice for the atrocities that the state perpetrated against them. As a result, on February 26, 2016, the court in Guatemala found Coronel Francisco Reyes Giron and former military commissioner Heriberto Valdez Asig guilty of crimes against humanity in the form of sexual violence, sexual and domestic slavery, humiliating and degrading treatment for disappearance and murder. After arriving in Izabal in 1982, Reyes Giron remained as the head of the Sepursarco military outpost. Valdez Axig, on the other hand, was a former municipal policeman whom the army had recruited as post that afforded him considerable authority to assist and participate in military operations. The court sentenced Reyes Giron to 120 years in prison and Valdez Asig to 240 years. Carmen Scholl y Cal, Sepur Sarco Survival, describe her reaction to the court's verdict. At the moment that the judges issued the verdict, I was excited. That's what I want. That's what I wanted for justice to be done. So my struggle was to tell my story. I did not go to lie. I went to tell everything I saw, everything I lived, and justice was done. I told all that I held in my heart. For me, justice is that no one else lives through all that we did. That women don't suffer, especially the young women today. And that what I suffered firsthand doesn't repeat itself. Likewise, legal professional and activists who worked with the poor Sarko women expressed their satisf satisfaction with the final verdict, as well as the trial's significance for survival of sexual violence during the Civil War. For Ada Valenzuela of the National Union of Guatemala Women, UNAMG, the development of the Sepur Sarko case is a historic fact that sets precedents in Guatemala and the world. The women spoke, they were heard, and every voice woven, woven in their testimonies corroborated the enormous pain that the women and their communities lived through during the war. 
we are convinced that it's fundamental to know the past in order not to repeat it. The women of the Sepur Sarko overcame, overcame to challenge of aging, illness, and opposition to demand publicly an end to these abuses and the state's role in perpetuating them. Their victory was a momentous because it was the first time in Guatemala history that national courts had collectively tried acts of sexual violence and sexual and domestic slavery committed during the internal armed conflict. Indeed, Sepur Sarko was the first time that a national court anywhere in the world had a rule on, on charges of sexual slavery during an armed conflict, a crime under international law. It was also the first sentence at a national level that tried to address inequalities and at least on paper, obligate the state to work on behalf of the communities. However, at the aftermath of the trial show, the hard part of transitional justice cases is making sure reparations signify structural benefits for those affected. Now I went to the fourth part of this presentation. As part of its verdict, court issued a, a series of 16 transform, transformative reparations measures that had the objective of providing dignified and holistic paths for the women of Sepur Sarko and their communities to reconstruct their life, ensure they did not return to us to a situation of a structural violence and discrimination, and slowly rebuild the social fabric that the army had attacked. At the state level, the court first ruled that the Ministry of Education should improve the infra infrastructure of schools in the Sepur Sarko, Pombaak, and La Esperanza communities, established bilingual secondary school award scholarships for all three levels of education for the entire population and include the Sepur Sarko case in the school books. Second, it, is, it starts that the Ministry of Culture should develop cultural projects for the women and the larger collectively created a documentary film about the case and translate the verdict into the 24, Ma uh, 24 May Mayan languages. Third, directed the Ministry of Health to build in the medium term a health center with all the necessary. Four, the court ordered the, the Ministry of Defense to incorporate topics about women's human rights and legislation for the prevention of the violence against women into military training courses. Fifth, it declared that the Guatemala state should continue the legalization of lands that the men and nervy communities had initiated before the army disappeared them. Finally, the court ordered the state to coordinate security measures to protect the, plain, the plaintiffs and their family members through its Ministry of the Interior. On a regional level, the court ruled that the municipality should build with within one year, a monument honoring the struggle of the women. The municipality should also work with development community from Sepur Sarco, San Marcos, Pombac, and La Esperanza to ensure the provision of basic public services in these communities and the women's homes. The Office of the Public Prosecutor, for its part, should continue investigating to determine the final whereabouts of, the, of those still missing. 
Finally, the court state that the conquering plaintiff's organization of querellantes should undertake the procedure to have February 26th declared to the day of victims of sexual violence and sexual and domestic slavery and that they should undertake the actions before the Guatemala Congress related to the law on enforced disappearance. Although the court did not designate a specific time frame or budget for the complaints of these dignified reparation measures. One of the women organization has coordinated periodic institutional round tables involving representatives from different ministries, ministries to promote communication, cooperation, and monitor the progress of implementation. As of the writing of this presentation, there has been limited progress related to implementing these reparation measures. Beyond this measure, progress has been difficult for many reasons, such as budgeting and legal constraint, construction challenges, and unresolved land positions issues, among other factors, have suspended plans. Unless the land is public, for example, construction cannot be for the permanent health center or high school, and the land is currently private. With respect to the access to arable land, the eighth official property owner of Sepur Sarcos territory came came to negotiation table after the trial verdict as of December 2017. However, they had no established with the Agrarian Affair Office, an acceptable price to sell the land. So prolonging the process for the state to purchase it on behalf of the community. While the primary, while the primary objective of the court order reparation measures was to transform the conditions of the vulnerability and marginalization in which the women of the Sepur Sarco and their communities live, they face largely the same challenges today. The living conditions in Sepur Sarco are testament to how insidious oppressions continue to, to affect indigenous war survivors. Indigenous war survivors did access roads to the communities are in rough conditions, winter storm washed away a key, uh, a key bridge in 2017, the Polo Chip River frequently floods and makes local transportation precarious, and there are no, are, and there are no potable water for residents. Sepur Sarko has a primary school, but the state provides no other levels of education for youth. As a result, they often migrate to work since job opportunities in the, in the area are limited to work or nearby African palm plantation. While the Sepur Sarko case offers some hope in matters of justice and human rights, it also exemplifies the shortcoming of reparation to fundamental address the structural issues of racism and discrimination that fed the crimes of the city six year long armed conflict. As it demonstrates, the Guatemalan state has done very little in transitional justice and reparation for the victims. Moreover, reparation in the Guatemala context often includes commitment that should already be the responsibility of the state. In the case of the Sepur Sarco, some of the transformative reparation measures, including the construction of a health center and housing for the women and a scholarship for the youth in the community to attend mid and high school, which have yet to materialize. Nevertheless, providing access to education 
and health service does not constitute reparation measures. These are basic obligations that the Guatemala state should already be providing to guarantee the life of its citizens. The state, the state should particularly focus on improving the living condition of the most impoverished people residing in rural regions and permanent exclusion. Most important, the fundamental issue of land tenure for the Quechi people who have lived for generations in Sepulsarco, one of the principal reasons why the military murdered and violated them in the first place, remained an unresolved. Reflecting on their ongoing demand for land, the Messiah yet another survival said, I want my children and grandchildren to be at peace, to be calm and have land to plant like we had before the conflict came. Through their bravery and determination, the women of Sepur Sarko inspires other survivors to break their silence and seek justice for the sexual violence. The collective effort results in a precedent sitting verdict and a clear call for the state to take up this historic debit toward their communities. So far, life in the, in the region has not fundamentally changed as poverty and state abandonment remind the norm. For these reasons, a primary, a prim, primary and, and elemental ch challenge moving forward is how to create and implement reparations that are both feasible and truly transformative for indigenous world survivors in the medium and long term. Complicating the panorama for, for transformative justice is the fact that to this day, the military retains control over the state and the public sphere, publishing academic history book to perpetuate an official narrative of the security forces and the army as a heroes of the nation. Indeed, political, military, and economic sectors in Guatemala are gaining strong campaigns against transitional justice trials through strategies intended to criminalize the survivors, family members, and witnesses. Furthermore, through institutions creating and focus on the peace process, the Guatemala state has been responsible for, in, in, for uh, obstructing access to files related to the armed conflict, spreading a culture of silence about the past, promoting the remilitarization of the country, especially in many communities fighting to protect their land and natural resources, and denying that genocide occurred in Guatemala. The economic elite of the country, fearing that the course of justice will reveal the, the direct involvement in crimes against humanity due to the role in financing the military's campaigns, have joined to the military association in their efforts to stop the justice. Now, I will finish with the conclusion. Given the, given the context, given this context, it is important to place the legal proceedings of the Sepur Sarko trial and verdict with both a jurisprudential and political framework. For Guatemala as a nation and for Maya women, the court's verdict represents a historic victory because it tested the country's judicial system, which is racist and indifferent to the atrocity that indigenous women have endured over the last genocide. Through their testimonies, determination to go before the court and struggle for more than 30 years, the Kichi women of the Sepur Sarko managed to move the Guatemala justice system and make the court base its final decision on the penal code. Thanks to their efforts, 
the court also determined that the crimes that Coronel Francisco Reyes and former military commissioner Heriberto Valdez had committed against girls and women as members of the Guatemala Army had violated international humanitarian law. Consequently, the Sepur Sarko case verdict in itself is a valuable document to read and, an, and analyze, not only for specialists, but also for youth and children, so that aware of these atrocities. Should, should the judicial process like Sepur Sarko are often celebrated for their implication for transitional justice worldwide. But the victories do, do not always translate into concrete benefits that can guarantee survival for the victims of these crimes and their families. The, the Kechi women who gave the testimony, most of whom are illiterate and do not speak Spanish, achieve with their courage what indigenous professionals or academics have been unable to do. They reclaim the dignity not only of the indigenous people of Guatemala, but also for indigenous peoples worldwide, who in different moments of the history have, have faced genocide and crimes against humanity. That said, that said that the struggle for justice does not end when the trials does. On the contrary, survival must keep in fighting against a society and a state that continue to dehumanize and criminalize them. In short, the court ordered transformative reparation measures that were meant to address women's experience of six years of sexual violence, slave labor, and especially the loss of their husband and older children ultimately fall short. First, because they are incapable of reparating the life that the women had with their families before the violence. And they are even less capable of rebuilding the social fabric of the region that remains fragmented until today. Second, overseeing the implementation of the reparation measures is the executive branch of government. And instead of being deep repairs are limited to tasks such as improve school infrastructure or a built health center are the intrinsic responsibility of the state according to its constitutional mandate. Hence, once again, hence, once again the state eludes its most fundamental responsibility and uses basic public policies to respond to these despicable crimes that truly need measures to profoundly transform and address the structural forces that facilitated the commission of this crime in the first place. If reparation measures fa fail to address the root causes of the violence against Kechi women, the communities, and so many other indigenous people during the internal conflict, it will be impossible to achieve truly reparative justice let alone another state or another Guatemala, which should be the ultimate aspiration of this judicial process. process. This problem associated with reparation by no means diminish the value of legal justice, which represent a hard fought and significant step in the right direction. However, it is structural changes to achieve long lasting structural changes. Therefore, it is imperative to continue dismantling the deeper causes of the violence that the state unleashed on Sepur Sarko, including racism, patriarchy, unequal distribution of the, of the wealth, 
concentration of land and natural resources, ideologies of terror and authoritarianism, and paths among corrupt economic and political elites without pursuing aggressive and sustained action in this area, the slow and incomplete implementation of reparation poses another violation of the dignity and rights of indigenous survival. For this reason, transformative reparations, while difficult to achieve, are necessary for a country as unequal as Guatemala. Transitional justice process are crucial so that one day the official narrative that continue to criminalize the survivors, labeling them communists, guerrilla, terrorists, revenge seekers, and freeloaders, we change. Hopefully, the trials taking place in Guatemala will finally lead all citizens to accept that historically racist is among the primary focus that have driving this state, its security forces and elites to commit inhuman acts against indigenous people. Despite the, despite the, the significant obstacles ahead, the Kekchi women of Sepur Sarko have hope for the future because the survivors and their descendants deserve process of truth and, and dignity that in the short and long term help to partially heal the deep heridas of the world. Mateo Chagüe, muchas gracias. Well, thank you very much. That was a very uh, moving presentation on a very difficult topic. Anybody who is at all familiar uh, with the history of Guatemala uh, can appreciate the significance of this talk. Um, so what we're going to do at this point in time, because we have approximately uh, 20 minutes left if we wanna con conclude by half past the hour, we're gonna move to questions and answers. And so the way we're gonna proceed with that, if you look at the bottom of your screen, at the menu at the bottom of your screen, you'll see there is a participants function. If you click on that, you can raise your hand and that will alert me that you wanna ask a question. Um, and what I'll do is I will gather three questions at a time and then I'll allow um, Irma to respond to those. Uh, you can also, if, if you do choose to raise your hand and ask a question, we'll ask you to activate your camera. You will be unmuted at that point uh, for the purposes of recording. If, if you're not comfortable with that, if you're watching this in your pajamas, for example, as somebody did last time, uh, you can do it through the chat function. Um, and I can read off your question if you're a little shyer. So um, does anybody have a question for Irma? No comments, uh, no necessary questions. You can share your comments right. or your experience with similar issues. Oh. We have somebody whose initials are RCC. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. My name is Marcela, and I want to make a comment because I, I want to congratulate you. I think it needs a lot of courage to be following and researching this part of the history that's so close to our blood and so close to the to our hearts and pain of others and. Thank you so much for sharing this with us and for helping open the eyes of many others that may not have heard this before and, or may not know about what has been happening for so long. So thank you so much, Irma. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcela, for, for being here. Gracias. Anybody else with a question or comment?
Claudia Calderon has a question or comment. Hi, uh, Irma Alicia, mucho gusto. My name is, and everybody here, my name is Claudia Calderon. I'm also from Guatemala. I'm uh, in Wisconsin currently. So uh, listening to, to this and relieving the experiences of uh, listening to the process in Guatemala was, was very, it's, it's emotional and, um, and I think that we need to, to look for ways as to unite among Guatemalans too, to, to find ways to work together, to find some ways to, to, to have the youth uh, raise more awareness among the youth, but also to find ways to support with different disciplines, justice is one, but I am in the agricultural sector, for example, and I work in projects with food security and food sovereignty. And, uh, and I think, you know, you mentioned so many aspects of having uh, the, like these women looking at their families die because they didn't have a lot of food. So um, if there are ways among people like and scientists from different disciplines to to collaborate in this um, sign me up and thank you again for for speaking up and and sharing the experiences of the people from the uh, the put starco muchas gracias Irma. thank you claudia for your See, I, I, I agree with you. We need to work together. Now we are more than three million, three million people from Guatemala to live outside Guatemala. The majority is here in the United States. This is, this is very sad because uh, in Guatemala, the opportunities are very, are very small, the violence, the sexual, uh, violence uh, against women in the city now is, 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 is high. So the situation is, is difficult. Our country needs uh, that uh, we work together. I, I totally agree with you, but also we need another, uh, another um, politics. The, the, the corruption is, is, is inside, is part of the heart of Guatemala. And I, I think the situation is not only there, also here, on, also in other parts of the of the of the world, we we are in in, in very difficult moments. The the corruption is everywhere, and and, uh, and I know we need we need to we need to work. We need to think uh, about what is the best way for our country, but also for the world. Thank you. Okay, I have a couple of more people who have indicated they'd like to either ask a question or make a comment, starting with Peter Haney, who can go first, and then Mario. Um, hello, Irma Alicia. Thank you uh, so much for this presentation. Uh, and I wonder, uh, just maybe piggybacking off that last question, could you talk about the role that Guatemalans outside of the country may have had in this process and what, what, what that says about mobilization that's happening between the US and Guatemala. Peter, and, nice, to, uh, nice to see you, Peter. Yes, it's great to see you. Uh, it's incredible, okay, okay. Uh, okay, about, about your question, well, uh, I, I think the the the, the idea uh, about the mobilization, about the work together, is important, but also is difficult. Guatemala has a lot of fractures inside and outside, uh, and the racism is part of this, but also the class oppression, you know. So uh, also the gender oppression. Guatemala inside has many Guatemalas. In one, in, one, in one hand, you can find the urban Guatemala. But 
But in the other, you can find many rural Guatemala with different situations. And the rural Guatemala, I, I don't want to represent as a victim. No, they, they, they work together every day. Uh, uh, now the rural Guatemala uh, produce all the food that the urban areas eat, you know? So the urban Guatemala depend of the, of the rural Guatemalans. And in the rural Guatemala, the majority of the population is indigenous, but they try, they, they, they have a lot of struggles because they produce, but they don't receive any, almost anything from the government. They pay taxes, indirect and direct taxes, but they don't receive the same for their for the, for the taxes. And also in, in, in the elites in Guatemala, the, the elite is very small. Only eight families control Guatemala. Only eight corporative families control almost everything, all the businesses. They have, the, these eight families have the control of, uh, uh, have the control of the, of the uh, executive, the Congress and the justice system in Guatemala. This is, this is incredible. They, now they, they act as a Guatemala, as the Guatemala as a, as a, as a farm. They, they think that Guatemala is their own private farm. This is incredible now. This is, but they have a lot of a historic, historic power, but actually they uh, have more power because they have the support of this administration from US. The actual administration of the US support the government, not only in Guatemala, also in Honduras, also in El Salvador, also in, in Colombia. So for this reason, the situation of Latin America is, is very hard. So more and more people want to come here. Why? For the, because the situation there is difficult to live. And not only the poor people, also the people that has Tyler, that has, um, uh, or, or, has or, or they have a small businesses, but they want to, to come here. Why? Because the possibilities there are almost closed. So we want to we want to work together we want to mobilize but i think it's, it's not easy it's, it's a complex it's a complex uh historic po problem and um first to mobilize i think we need to we need to understand and we need to 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 talk inside what guatemala we want it and what latin america we want it thank you very much for that so Mario is the next person. If Mario, when you ask a question, if you could activate your camera, um, if you're comfortable with that, we'd appreciate it. Yes. Uh, hola, Irma Alicia. It's, it's un gusto verte por este medio. Uh, we're sad that we couldn't have you in person, but thank you for uh, making the time to uh, to share your um, all your uh, experience and, and research uh, with us, sister. Uh, quite humbling to um, uh, to hear everything that you had to share. And, and this is coming from me because uh, 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 my family is from mostly the Chisek area there in Kowam. But um, uh, I'm also, I always, uh, when I can't fall asleep, I think about the, what's, what's the future like for, for a, a place like Guatemala? What's what's gonna take for, for the country to really uh, come together and find the direction that it's that is best for everyone and then um I th and then i think about covid-19 and and also the impact that it's having in 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 most of these small communities so um again um how do we create that future and and do you see any hope in the in the next uh, in the near future thank you Thank you. Querido Mario, it's nice to see you. Thank you so much for, for your intervention and also for all for, for your support. Well, I think we need in Guatemala another economic and political system, but not only Guatemala. I think also here, we need another system or, a, or other economic system. 
not only to produce and to consume, we need to think ab about other ways of, of life. And uh, I don't want, uh, I, I don't want to romanticize indigenous people because this is not, uh, this is not okay. But uh, I, I think we need to, we need to see how another communities live in, in the country, in, in the world. Uh, and many indigenous communities in different, uh, in different forms, they, they have a, 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 another system different they they don't nobody live the same but they have another values uh, probably we need to we need to see those communities we need to see those examples here in the united states we have um many indigenous indigenous people the native people from here uh, we need to learn from them also we need to hear them uh but they are it's in it's almost difficult that the that the status quo gave bo voice to them. So probably the solution is is not only for the academia. Uh, it's a combination of every sector and every pueblos. And probably we need to be more sensible, more sensible for other uh, forms of life. We have another co couple of people who would like to either make a comment or ask a question, starting with Addison. Go ahead, Addison. Hi. Um, so I guess my question is, where you were talking about um, like the how racism has happened in Guatemala historically, um, and also how um, like the corruption within the government, but I guess I'm wondering of uh, any like counter social movements that are already trying to work on some of these issues that you might know about um, that, like in the US, we're having a huge reckoning with um, anti racism, but um, through a bunch of protests, I was wondering if there are similar movements um, bubbling up in Guatemala. Thank you for your question. Um, Addison, thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, we have uh, indigenous people. Is uh, um, they have a lot of organizations in Guatemala. They they are a, a indigenous people is a key actor in, uh, in 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 Guatemala after the 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 last genocide. So they they uh, um, they they are organized against many things that are uh, bad against the majority of the population. They speak up, for example, against the, uh, against the international, how the international uh, capitalism try to take out their lands, for example how the international capitalism use the water of the community for their own uh, interest and against the, the interest of the people. Also, they uh, speak up against the corruption, but also we have a peasant organization. They are very strong uh, and or the, they are not only indigenous, they, uh, those organization also has um, Ladino and Mestizo, poor people, but also the, the uh, public university, the Universidad de San Carlos has a very, now in, in the last year, ha, has a very strong um, a student organization and they speak up. Also, we have in Guatemala incredible leaders and, and organizations and, and people that speak up for all this, this situation. And um, the racism is a point that many of them are talking, but it's different. It's different the situation from the U.S. and the Guatemala in, in this in this case, because here the 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 people is more sensible about the racism. Probably not the majority, but here there is more university, more or more other. Mm -hmm of other spaces, but in Guatemala, we are talking about the racism since, uh, since uh, the Spain, Spanish uh, took the lands 
the land, you know, but it's, it's very difficult. It's so difficult. The elite in Guatemala, they don't want to hear about the races because when we are talking about the races, they, we are talking about the privileges and they don't want to lose the privileges because they, or they almost have everything. So if, they, if, if, if we are talking about the races and if we work for, for dismantle the racism, it implies that they want to lose their privileges and they don't want to, they don't want to do this. And it's more, and Guatemala is very small country. So we, we, we try, but it's not easy, but we, we continue. We publish, we speak up, we, we have a lot of, a lot of um, spaces where we talk, but it's not, it's not easy. It's easy for us, but not for to, to touch, to change the, the power. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one more one more question, which comes via chat from Samantha, who asks, have other cases of human rights abuses gone forward through the penal system, the court system in Guatemala? Excuse me, excuse me, uh, Patrick, I didn't understand the question. You are you you speak very fast. Oh, my my apologies. Uh, Samantha asks via chat, have other cases of human rights abuses gone forward through the penal system or the court system in Guatemala? Okay, thank you. Now I got it. Okay, yeah, that is not the only case. We have uh, more cases. The, the, for ejemplo, Embajada de, the La Quema de la Embajada de España. We have uh, the, um, the trial against General Efraín Ríos Montt. It was in 2013. It was incredible, incredible trial. And for the first time, a, a, a general like Efraín Ríos Montt uh, went, to, went, to, went to justice. And uh, uh, probably, uh, I, I, I don't remember now, but there is more than 13 trials he, uh, that uh, like uh, Sepur Sarko or General Efraín Ríos Montt, that the indigenous people are uh, pushed to go to the justice system. So the, for us, the transitional justice is important. It's not the only way, but it's important because we want that the people know what happened in our country. If the people know uh, through the voices of, of the survivor, it's, must, it's more easy to believe. And we hope that in the future, nobody confront the same crimes that we confront during the, the last genocide. For this reason, we are working very hard in the, in the justice system. And uh, uh, we work, uh, is it the, the survivors, but also with the lawyers, with the with the with the expert from Guatemala and from other countries and from communities, uh, uh, one uh, for example the the Sepur Sarko trial, uh, it, it was uh, it was uh, 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 a incredible incredible uh, uh, it's demands incredible work time for many people and during many years it's not easy. But that is the only way now that the that the system and the people from Guatemala know what happened in, in during the civil the civil war. So we have many many other cases. Well, uh, I'm afraid that we've reached our, our time of the, to end this uh, particular event. It's now a little past four thirty Central Time, and I want to thank you very much for this really amazing and stimulating talk. Um, this is just a, a, the first of two talks, I wanna remind people, the second one of which is tomorrow also at three o'clock and it's titled, An Indigenous Approach to the Current Immigration Crisis, Crisis in scare quotes. Um, it, this was advertised in Spanish, but it's going to be done in English. So anybody who might've been a little hesitant to attend, uh, either you or your friends, please let them know that they can see that or hear that talk in English. 
The other thing that I wanted to remind you is that we have a couple of talks next week as well uh, by Stephanie Luce and Helen Scott. If you look, we will post in the chat function uh, the connection, the link to our website, uh, and you can see the entire list of all of our talks for the remainder of the semester, including tomorrow's. All you need to do, just like this one, is to register free of charge, and you'll get the link to those talk, to that talk. All right, thank you once again. Uh, I'm sure that I speak for everyone in saying this was really great, and I'm very anxious at looking forward to tomorrow's talk. Thank you.